But I did say the problem. The problem is not the input. The problem is the output. Uh, okay. the product, uh, um, we, we still have two minutes, so it, maybe it will. Be Uh, however, I think we can just start, and I will start without uh, yeah. the slides, you if it's can, okay. Uh, work without uh, slides for the first uh, few minutes. Well, I will just uh, need the computer, basically, to look at the slides myself, so my computer will not okay. be available anymore. That's the only uh, thing, so if, if you can put it on another computer, uh, I, I will just take this off, okay, and okay. start to present. With the laptop? With my laptop and uh, without the slides on the screen for the audience, but I will explain basically the content on the slides or however. Right, so it's just going to be a speech. You'll use your slides to help you remember? Exactly. Right. Exactly. We really need a slide for the debates. Uh -huh. We're doing our best. Okay, so really let's just go ahead without the projector. Right. And appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I can use this if need be. So I will do. You do have a um, green okay. board, I guess, and uh, yes. chalk. Okay. That's fine. So I apologize. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty with Christina's slides, but hopefully we'll get that fixed shortly. But she's going to go ahead and get started. So thank you, Christina. Yes. So hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, in my defense, I do have slides, uh, but they are here, so I will use them for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, so uh, my. Um, my, my challenge would be basically to attract the attention here and not on the screen. Um, okay, and uh, I am, however, very excited to be here and to present you some aspects regarding technology challenges for privacy, the case of decentralized social media. Uh, first of all, a small disclaimer. This talk is not uh, legal advice. It is meant to be taken generic. And it's not to be applied to a certain particular situation. If you're searching for legal advice, I strongly encourage you to go and seek it. Uh, and also, it's meant to be a bridge between technical aspects and the legal community. And this means that it's sort of sacrificing a bit of uh, legal and technical procedure in order for it to be more uh, more adjusted for both the communities, the legal community and also the technical community. I'm sorry, Kat. You need to put output to the HDMI. Because there is no output from your laptop directly. No, let her, let her speak. Yeah, you give me, give me your. Okay. I'll, I'll do it with the laptop. Okay. It matches, so. You can get to do Yes, so no, it's okay. Um, okay. So to continue, uh, some. Um, some legislation, I think you, everybody heard about the GDPR, it's very, it's very, we are very aware of its existence, uh, is meant to protect personal data. And personal data means, in the sense of the GDPR, personal identifiable data, and that means basically any data that can be used to identify an individual alone or corroborated with another type of data. Uh, and here I would like to mention, for example, name, email, address, phone number, but also IP address and uh, login IDs, images, social media posts, and so on. Um, then uh, on my slide I have a few, um, I have a few um, um, statistics regarding the fact that uh, main social media platforms have increased their number of users, and we are talking about billions of people that are currently using social media. Uh, and on the other side, we have decentralized social media, uh, which, uh, for example, Mastodon, uh, where we have also a certain number of people, so it attracts attention, and uh, also a significant number of toots, which is, uh, in fact, more than uh, 1 quadrillion, 562 trillion, and so on. So we have a lot of personal data that is out there and that is being given away willingly by us, consensual. Uh, and here we find ourselves in our... In our uh, society basically in a situation of being in a privacy paradox because ourselves we are giving away uh, consensual our uh, private data but on the other from from the other point of view uh, we are uh, we are seeing ourselves uh, basically in a situation of uh, of um, 
of how to say, how to explain, uh, give away our data willingly, but on the other side, we find a lot of awareness campaigns and a lot of situations uh, where we hear from everywhere that privacy is important, we should care about our privacy and so on. But on the other side, uh, we are giving away our data. And this creates a situation of uh, maybe a black box society. It has been said that we are living in a black box society where hidden algorithms can make uh, or ruin reputation, decide the destiny of entrepreneurs, or even devastate an entire economy. Um, just uh, one second. Is, is everything OK? Uh, OK. So uh, we have uh, uh, some privacy design strategies. Uh, and this, uh, this need for privacy by design, the principle of privacy by design from the GDPR, becomes more stringent in such a situation because it eliminates the aspect of us consenting to give away our private data. And, the, and it, it, it's basically very important to have people, uh, to, have, uh, to have the people uh, uh, that uh, are, uh, that uh, are taking uh, into consideration the principle of privacy by design and incorporate privacy requirements into account right from the start and throughout uh, the system development life cycle. And this means, according to this philosophy of privacy by design, the fact that privacy should be regarded as an intrinsic software attribute. And we can identify eight main uh, privacy strategy, privacy design strategy existent. We have basically, uh, we should look at them basically as an ideal concept because the point is to aim to reach some of them. And also neither of them in itself is ensuring compliance with privacy by design. Now, uh, regarding these privacy design strategies, uh, they are split into two main categories based on, uh, based on how, what they tackle. On one side, they are tackled data-oriented aspects, and on the other side, we are talking about processes inside an organization. Now, the first one is minimize. I will not actually go and discuss about each of them very in detail. I will focus just on one, which is separate. But just to give you a glimpse of it, the first one is minimize, which means basically that the amount of personal data that is processed should be restricted to a minimal amount possible. And as main tactics recommended, we have uh, select, which means that we should select the relevant people and the relevant attribute. Exclude, which means basically that uh, we should exclude people or attributes from the beginning. Uh, remove data and also destroy it permanently. Uh, the second one is hide. And hide means that any personal information should be hidden from plain view. Uh, for example, in a situation of mixed networks to hide patterns or in a situation where there is a request for the right to be forgotten, uh, the data to be deleted, but it's not really deleted, it's still kept on, uh, on our databases. In that situation, that data still exists and should be made uh, unlinkable and should be made unrelatable, basically. And the main tactics in, in this principle uh, is uh, dissociate, encrypt, uh, and uh, restrict access to uh, personal information. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, then, uh, from the point of view of abstract, uh, you should limit the details in which uh, personal data is processed, which means that uh, personal data should be processed at the highest level of aggregation and with the latest level of detail necessary for the purposes of, uh, of the processing. And as main tactics, uh, they are... Uh, they are basically uh, recommending to summarize details into a more general attribute and also to group, basically to abstract information at the level of a group of people uh, instead of processing it at the level of a single person. Another one which is more related to processes is inform, which means that uh, data subjects, uh, they should be informed about the uh, processing of their personal data in a timely and uh, plain language manner. And as main tactics, we have supply, uh, make information available, basically. We have notify, for example, notify about the breach occurring. Uh, we have explain in a concise and plain language manner. And also, uh, we have another strategy, which is control, uh, which means that uh, we should provide the means necessary in order to tackle the consent of the, of the person. And as main tactics, we have uh, ask for consent. That means that the consent should be explicit, freely given, in, in, offered in an informed manner. Uh, we should give the user a real choice. Uh, we should uh, offer means to review and update uh, personal information. And we should also retract, offer the possibility to retract consent. And 
Another two, uh, enforce and demonstrate uh, the aspect of enforcement. We should establish privacy policies inside our organizations. And as main tactics, we have uh, create, maintain, and update these privacy policies and also demonstrate, which means basically that uh, we should be taken accountable to prove compliance with privacy regulations. As a main tactics, the recommendation would be to audit, to record, to report uh, to, private, uh, to privacy authorities. And then we have finally separate. The separate aspect means that as a best practice, we should distribute or isolate any processing of personal data, storage, collection, operations performed. And as main tactics, we have isolate. And isolation means that we should process personal data in separate databases or apps independently without access or correlation between parts. And also a second one, which is very relevant for this, for this talk, is distribute. That means that we should partition personal data so that more access is required in order to process it. Uh, and we should distribute the processing of personal data over different physical locations uh, with no uh, control from one single entity. And we should use the equipment of the data subject himself and uh, versus uh, as opposed to central components. And basically, we should use decentralized over centralized as a best practice. Now, if we think about the current state, the status quo, how social media looks like, and if we think about the ideal social network from the perspective of these eight principles, we see that there's a long way to go. So basically, there are a lot, there's a lot of room from improve, for improvement. However, the point being is that if there is such an ideal social network, the social network would be decentralized. And users would store basically their personal information on their own devices and share them in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. A decentralized system, basically, if we go more deep into the matter, we discover that it's not just peer-to-peer. -peer, and it's a distributed system where uh, multiple authorities control different components. And there is basically no single authority that uh, <clears throat> is fully trusted by others. And we have a large variety of designs, uh, starting from the peer-to-peer -peer fashion and ad hoc mesh and so on, until we go to, for example, a more complex uh, structures, which are federated supernode networks. Uh, regarding federated systems, uh, the, as a characteristics of these systems, we have the provider nodes, which act as an authority, and uh, they are being trusted, basically, by other users. Uh, each provider is responsible for its own users. Uh, between providers, there is collaboration in order to provide a service. Uh, there is uh, no single provider that has authority over the rest. Uh, the infrastructure is usually independent, and the providers act as a super node in terms of routing. And as a backside, the provider itself, because the responsibility falls upon itself, is actually the main target for attacks related to security. And the provider has the potential to violate the privacy of the nodes based on design choices on the platform. As main benefits of decentralized social media, uh, we have the aspect of surveillance, the fact that it's more challenging to take place. Uh, there is no entity in control, so obviously it's, it's easier uh, to avoid such a situation. Because of the diversity location, uh, this can overpass censorship, political censorship. Uh, we are talking about, because of this model, about distributed trust, which means that the network can be built in such a way uh, that uh, part of the nodes are trustworthy, and in this context, the security of the network is preserved, and from this benefit, for example, blockchains are taking advantage a lot of this feature. Uh, we have integrity, uh, which means that uh, the model is more robust versus uh, an attack that is, meant down, uh, that is meant to take down the entire network because of being decentralized. Uh, from the point of view of confidentiality, the framework could act as a field uh, for third parties. And uh, also, uh, from the point of view of serenity from the user, the user is more in control of the personal data. And uh, uh, it avoids the uneven balance of power be between centralized operators and users. Because in the end, in a centralized network, we are seeing ourselves in an uneven balance of power, where we have the, the operator, which sees everything on the platform, and we have the small user that uses that platform. But in the decentralized model, this balance of power shifts, and it's more even. As challenges of decentralization, we have, in fact, surprised the GDPR framework 
which is pretty much meant to, uh, if, if you read the GDPR, you will see that it's more meant to, uh, to discuss about the centralized cloud-based internet. So it's more, it more talks uh, for the situation of having a company or an organization or an individual and uh, uh, the relationship with their cloud provider. It talks about a data controller and a data processor. It does not refer directly to the situations when we, ha when we have peer-to-peer -peer networks. So this framework itself is, uh, let's say, uh, not very clear from the, per from the perspective of the law. And also we have difficulties applying some aspects, the right to be forgotten, for example, how do we apply it to blockchains? Or how do we apply data minimization to, uh, to such big databases? And on the other side, we can notice also some trade-offs that are happening. Because in a situation of centralization versus decentralization, in fact, the trade-off is trust versus transparency. Trust in the central provider in the case of centralization, and in the case of decentralization, we are giving away privacy, uh, sorry, transparency, because the interactions are, the interactions happening on the network, they are becoming more visible on the network in order for the decentralized system to exist. And uh, there is no content transparency, uh, but there is a protocol transparency. So by transparency, I'm not talking about uh, the content itself, because from the point of view of the content, we are more, especially if we, if we think about encryption mechanisms, we are more okay. The content that we post on mm -hmm. social media, which is decentralized, is more protected. But from the point of view of the metadata, uh, there are uh, a radical uh, uh, transparency at the level of the protocol of, or the metadata. So this, this, is, uh, this is problematic from this point of view. So when we talk about this trade-off of transparency, we are referring more about, uh, about uh, uh, not content transparency, but more uh, protocol and metadata transparency, which needs to, work, to be working. Somebody was telling me that uh, uh, metadata is for a decentralized system, like uh, the oil is for an engine to function. So in order for it to function, we do need to have access to this and we do need to build this trust between nodes. Now, uh, a very interesting uh, example is the example of the Fediverse, uh, where uh, we can find present on the platform and as actors present, we have users, lots of data subjects. We have instance administrators. They are the ones that maybe they are processors or the controllers from the perspective of the GDPR. Uh, or they are programmers or protocol designers. Uh, for, for example, uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we are talking about activity pub being the protocol. And uh, uh, from the point of view of the instance admins, because they are the, the ones that uh, are processing or they are controlling information. In the sense of the framework of the GDPR, are we talking about a data processor or a data controller? And I asked this question and uh, uh, the conclusion that I've reached is that, uh, and it's a personal conclusion, is the fact that if you are just a simple admin who just installs, for example, Mastodon or Pleroma and has no idea how they are working, you should be treated as a processor from the perspective of the GDPR, for example. But if you are a Someone who writes a Fediverse instance, for example, that collects all the data in order to do analytics and add tech, in that situation you should be seen as a controller in the sense of the GDPR. However, the framework that the GDPR is proposing is a framework that is not very specifically applied uh, to this situation. So it's just an interpretation at this point. Now, in terms of what we should do further in order to ameliorate to, to make the situation better. From the point of view of the legislators, legislators should align legislation with tech particularities and also they should uh, keep up basically with the tech innovation because I'm not sure exactly if this might be a reason but when the GDPR started to be a thing and people started to discuss about it around 2012, uh, in that situation, decentralized social media was very at the beginning. So maybe they did not took into consideration this uh, particular situation, this particular framework. However, things are moving, and in the future, I do expect that we will have clear answers about how to tackle this aspect, and we will not, uh, we will not uh, remain with questions unanswered, basically. And also from the point of view of technology, because we also have some issues from this point of view, technology should align to law's principle of privacy by design. 
uh, because mm -hmm. decentralization alone, with all those principles that I was stating in my talk, decentralization alone is not enough to be a better alternative to centralized systems, uh, privacy-wise. It needs to be doubled by other uh, privacy strategies. Because if you have a system which is decentralized, that doesn't mean that you are compliant with privacy by design. Alone, it does not get you to compliance. However, if there exists such a thing as a social media network which is ideal uh, and incorporates all eight principles, if that network definitely should be decentralized. Um, so uh, that was it. Uh, we still have five minutes for questions. And uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, uh, I will, however, post the slides uh, uh, after after this uh, this talk. And uh, and thank you very much for for attending it. Let's give one extra applause for persevering and giving an amazing talk during the most distracting circumstances. Does anyone have any questions? So on the, um, you, you said that uh, essentially decentralized um, social media doesn't or isn't covered by the GDPR because it only focuses on controllers and, pro and processors, which is of course correct. But I would argue, well, there's also joint controllership. We just don't know what it means yet and how to interpret it exactly. exactly. Um, and but on the other hand, if you look at like the ECJ decisions that are coming out, we're actually getting to a point where it's pretty clear that all of that is covered and they are actually all just joint controllers, which doesn't make it any better because then you just get to get into the whole discussion around what contracts do you need to put in place, right? Um, but I would say it's, it's very much covered. Um, it's just really hard to implement the GDPR properly in that kind of context, right? Um, that's one comment I would have, not really a question. The other thing, um, blockchains and right to be forgotten, um, isn't the reason for the right to be forgotten to be, sorry, for the right to be forgotten to be hard in that context that you actually, oh, not you, but controllers actually overstretch the um, consent as legal basis and don't rely on contracts, for example, sufficiently enough? Well, according According to the GDPR, it's not just consent the reason why we are processing personal data, but it is basically a best practice because if we would have an informed free given consent, uh, then uh, it would be very, very nice to, uh, to uh, process personal data based on that consent or that contract because in the end the contract is giving consent, but it's not, it's just treated separated from this point of view. Uh, I would, uh, I would say that we also have legitimate interest and usually uh, technologies that do not answer, do not uh, enter in situations of having a contract or in having, uh, 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 or having consent freely given, uh, then we also have legitimate interest. It's, it's a trap, basically, a, a, a technical trap, let's call it like that, but uh, it, it's something that definitely can have an answer from the point of view of the law, because the law, however, needs to be interpreted and applied to specific situations. Thanks for your talk. Um, did you have a look at uh, Secure Scuttlebutt, where you own your own data as an, in a social network? And if yes, what do you think about it? I, I am not, I did not hear the question. Um, did you have a look at Secure Scuttlebutt, where you own your social media data, and uh, what do you think about it, if you took a look at this? I, I did not, I heard about it, but I did not look at it. I, I think we're out of time. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's okay. I'm not. Do you not? No, I'm not eating. But yeah, it's a, it was a pleasure.